Our first panelist is my friend Bart Legum, who is a partner in the Denton's office in Paris and is the head of the firm's investment treaty arbitration practice. From the year 2000 to the year 2004, Bart served as the chief of the NAFTA arbitration division in the Office of Legal Advisor at the United States Department of State. In that capacity, Bart acted as lead counsel for the United States government in defending over $2 billion in claims submitted to arbitration under the investment chapter of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is NAFTA. And every case that Bart worked on was decided in uh, the United States government's favor while Bart worked there. Uh, Bart is the chair of the American Bar Association section on international law uh, that has over 23,000 members from over 90 countries in the world. And Bart has uh, had an excellent tenure as chair with some very large, impressive meetings that were attended by many uh, lawyers from all over the world who all uh, thought they were excellent meetings. Uh, he's the editor of the International Litigation Strategies Practice Book. And we hope that in addition to introducing this topic today, uh, Bart will discuss his recent victory in the Rumbatral versus Romania arbitration, a case which he worked on for many years. So Bart, if you would begin, please. All right, well, thank you very much, Linda. I'm gonna scoot over here next to the microphone so you can hear me a little bit better. So, so arbitration is a type of proceeding that is principally concerned with civil and commercial matters. And the vast majority of arbitrations deal with topics that are in that area and only in that area. Um, however, criminal law can enter into international arbitrations in a number of different ways. Um, it can be relevant in proving the claim. For example, a criminal law may help to define the standard of conduct that a party is alleged to have breached in an extra contractual claim in an arbitration. It can be relevant to proving a defense, such as when the respondent in the case asserts that the contract in question was the result of bribery. Acts in international arbitrations can themselves sometimes attract the criminal law, just as acts in court proceedings do. So you can have instances where documents are alleged to have been forged, where witnesses have been alleged to be intimidated, where arbitrators have alleged to be either intimidated or corrupted by a party. Um, in some instances, you can even have arbitration as the instrument of a criminal act, uh, of a fraud. Um, I'll, I'll give here one example that, that was related to me by the head of an arbitration institution, which shall remain nameless. But you can see why it attracted considerable uh, concern on the part of the arbitration institution. Day one, an arbitration request is brought against a state. Let's call the state Ruritania. The arbitration request proposes to name an unknown person from the state of Ruritania as the sole arbitrator of the in the case, in contradiction to the usual way that tribunals are constituted under the rules. Day 10, the state, surprisingly, intervenes immediately and accepts the idea of having Mr. X, uh, this previously unknown uh, resident of Ruritania, serve as the sole arbitrator in the case. Uh, shortly after that, the state uh, submits a, a, a defense to the arbitration in which it does not object to the jurisdiction of the tribunal or otherwise present any kind of serious uh, defense. The case lingers there and never goes further, as it turns out. Um, press reports indicated that the Attorney General of Ruritania had been assassinated by criminal elements in that country in the meantime. Um, but the circumstances uh, that were related to me are certainly suspicious and consistent with an attempt to use arbitration as a means of prosecuting a, a fraudulent claim against a state. Another uh, instance where criminal proceedings can be relevant is when criminal proceedings themselves are the subject of the arbitration. And that's the topic that I'd like to address a little bit today and 
which was addressed in the Ron Patrol case that Linda alluded to. Uh, so that topic is specifically when criminal proceedings are the act of the state that is alleged to breach the state's obligations under an international investment treaty. So international investment treaties, for those who are not familiar with them, are a form of treaty that provides basic protection for foreign investment, uh, including prohibitions of expropriation without compensation, requirements of national treatment, most favored nation treatment, that sort of thing. Uh, and they typically also provide for arbitration between the state and the company that alleged uh, a violation of the treaty uh, directly. So the company, the investor, can take the state to arbitration under the treaty. And there's about 3,000 of these treaties in force in the world today. Um, it, it is, of course, quite clear that the mechanism of criminal law proceedings is one of the fundamental pillars of the rule of law in every state and one of the fundamental ways in which every state protects its population uh, and ensures that society uh, is, uh, is one that, is, that has a certain amount of order to it and is one in accordance with law. However, it's also quite clear that that mechanism when it's abused, can be a terrible instrument of impunity on the part of the state. The United States Constitution's Bill of Rights was itself a response to abuses of criminal proceedings during the revolutionary period in the United, well, in, in, in the, the colonies in America. Um, Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables, which is now a film that's playing in, in theaters these days, uh, also concerns the abuse of criminal proceedings to, to terrible and destructive ends. So this, this is not a, a new problem that I'm talking about. But today, uh, the potential impact of an abuse of criminal proceedings is significantly greater uh, than it has been in the past. Uh, particularly when it comes to its impact on foreign investors. Banks today have know your customer requirements, KYC requirements, that require them to do due diligence on uh, people that want to have access to financing. And a company that has been accused, or a company that has executives that have been accused of committing crimes has a much more difficult time getting financing to allow the company to grow uh, than is the case for other people. Public companies, uh, the markets react very rapidly and very negatively to criminal prosecutions being announced against the company or against executives. And of course for the executives themselves, uh, Interpol warrants uh, make it very difficult for business to be conducted uh, and for people to travel as is essential for, for international business more generally. So how does one tell the difference between a legitimate criminal prosecution and abusive ones? What, when is it that prosecution turns to persecution? That's one of the important questions. Um, another is if international arbitration can attack criminal proceedings, when is that a legitimate use of the international arbitration uh, uh, mechanism and when is that an attempt by defendants in criminal proceedings to use international arbitration as a means to thwart uh, otherwise legitimate prosecutions? Uh, these and a number of other questions uh, were addressed recently in the ROM Patrol case and in the short amount of time uh, that I have remaining, I'd like to just quickly review with you some of the more important uh, discussion of these issues in that decision, uh, which is a public decision. It's available on the, on the ICSID website. So uh, on the topic of uh, w which I just addressed, which is uh, if arbitration can, can attack criminal proceedings, how is a tribunal to approach the issue? The ROM Patrol Tribunal said at paragraph 152, and I'm quoting, 
The tribunal wishes to make it plain from the outset that it would be acutely sensitive to any well-founded allegation that the investment arbitration process before it was intended to or was in fact operating in such a way as to block or prohibit the legitimate operation of the state's inherent function in the investigation, repression, and punishment of crime, including economic crime and corruption. At the same time, the tribunal acknowledges the validity of claimant's argument that the pursuit of crime, or even its mere invocation, cannot serve on its own as a justification for conduct that breaches the rights of foreign investors under applicable treaties. To all of which the tribunal adds a writer of its own, namely that association with the management of a foreign investor or a foreign investment cannot serve to immunize individuals from the normal operation of the criminal law irrespective of whether the individual is a local national or a foreign national. Another interesting question that the tribunal addressed was when do actions in criminal proceedings against a company, uh, against company executives, give rise to a potential claim by the company that's the foreign investor? And here I'd like to refer to page 104 of the decision. Um, where the tribunal said, the tribunal accordingly reaches the conclusion that the following, and only the following, would fall within the area of protection under the bid. Actions against the investor itself, or the investment. Action against the investor's executives for their activity on behalf of the investor. And action against the executives personally, but with the intent to harm the investor. Uh, another important topic the tribunal addressed was what kind of acts give rise to liability? And here I would refer to page 149 of the award, where the tribunal stated that a state may, not, may incur international responsibility for breaching its obligation under an investment treaty to accord fair and equitable treatment to a protected investor by a pattern of wrongful conduct during the course of a criminal investigation or prosecution, even where the investigation and prosecution are not themselves wrongful. The provisos are, however, that the pattern must be sufficiently serious and pertinent, that the interests of the investor must be affected, and that there is a failure in these circumstances to pay adequate regard to how those interests ought to be duly protected. In the tribunal's considered view, it is part of the legitimate expectations of a protected investor without in any way trenching upon the sovereign right of the host state to prescribe and enforce its criminal law that if its interests find themselves caught up in the criminal process either directly or indirectly, means will be sought by the authorities of the host state to avoid any unnecessarily adverse effect on those interests or at least to minimize or mitigate the adverse effects. And the final uh, question that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention is, is the tribunal in this case found that there was a breach of the treaty in the acts of the prosecutors. Uh, and in doing so, it, it made the, the following general statement about its finding of liability. The tribunal wishes to make it plain that it would not regard any breach, or indeed any series of breaches of procedural safeguards provided by national or international law in the context of a criminal investigation or prosecution as giving rise to the breach of an obligation of fair and equitable treatment. All will depend on the nature and strength of the evidence in the particular case, on the impact of the events complained about on the protected investor or investment, and on the severity and persistence of any breaches that can be duly proved, as well as on whatever justification the respondent state may offer for the course of events. The tribunal's finding is based entirely on the facts of the present case. And so that, in the end, is probably the best guidance, which is it really all depends on the facts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. 
Our next speaker is uh, Ekaterina Kudelich, the Deputy Director of International Law and Cooperation Department at the Supreme Commercial Court of the Russian Federation, and she's also an Associate Professor in the Russian Academy of Justice. She specializes in issues of judicial protection of foreign investments, foreign state immunity, international commercial transactions and arbitration, and the collaboration of national courts with foreign, international, and supranational courts. Uh, she's the drafter of the Review of Commercial Courts Practice on the Application of Public Policy as a Ground of Refusal for Recognition of Enforcement of Foreign State Decisions and Arbitral Awards. And she's one of the leading drafters of the Russian version of class action law and an author of more than 30 publications. Katerina. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> uh, if you allow me, I will then proceed in Russian. Uh, Uh, when I thought what could I be talking about uh, within this framework of uh, arbitration in criminal cases, I thought that uh, the most interesting issue to elaborate on would be to speak about corruption in arbitration. As Linda has already pointed out, this year has been uh, can be noted for the fact that the High Arbitration Court, for the first time, uh, codified uh, the practice uh, on uh, using you know, the public procedure amendment uh, uh, on the obligatory enforcement of the uh, rulings of the international arbitration. It, and for the first time, uh, this amendment, this clause, uh, uh, we took several cases to show how the state court should react uh, to the corruption issues once they uh, happen in arbitration. And uh, since we're uh, only beginning this work, uh, we used the simplest uh, case, and I will I'll explain why. But for the first time, Russia said that to, I mean, for the courts, this corruption, uh, corruption is, uh, public, I mean, should be made public, and uh, the courts should refuse to enforce the rulings uh, in the cases based on corruption, uh, corruption uh, uh, agreements. Uh, there's another aspect to, uh, to the matter, and this is something I would like to elaborate first. Uh, it's allegations of corruption, uh, when, uh, when allegations, when uh, alleged cor uh, member, I mean, alleged participant, participant of this corruption is an arbitrator. Uh, in my uh, presentation, I would like to talk about the uh, international, uh, ordinary international uh, commercial arbitration when you have two parties arguing, not the state and the investor. But it's very often we face these uh, issues of corruption. This year has been interesting because our our arbitrary community uh, for the first time over the past 20 years uh, our arbitrary community arbitrators realized uh, that uh, we cannot go on like this and uh, the reason was uh, that arbitration as as it is has been dis has discredited itself uh, for the business community and uh, for the courts. Uh, the reasons being a situation, I mean, uh, uh, the reason being a number of factors. Uh, the first one is in Russia, uh, we have about 2,000 arbitration courts. Uh, and and registered uh, uh, as arbitration courts are uh, uh, 1,500, about 1,500 are registered officially, but the rest are not registered officially. So the majority of these arbitration courts uh, are allegedly uh, providing uh, non, I mean, uh, arbitration which is non-compliant with uh, with any any rules. As for internal rulings, uh, 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 they often show that the parties 
in fact uh, breach the law and take part in corruption since many rulings that are passed by the arbitration courts uh, are marked by the previous date, for example, uh, which is, uh, or a lot of them uh, legitimize uh, unlawful transaction, transactions or unlawful agreements. Uh, and this is something that we have to react to. Plus, there is another moment, another aspect. A big number of arbitration courts in Russia are, uh, are corrupted because uh, 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 the high arbitration court has uh, viewed certain cases when the arbitrator was uh, uh, the director of the legal department of one of the parties. He acted as an arbitrator. And uh, he, uh, he had a right to appoint the presiding, the chairman uh, in the arbitration. So large companies, they had their own arbitration courts under their, their own jurisdiction. Uh, however, in the arbitration courts, we never had a case when someone would uh, rely, would uh, provide the evidence of corruption, of bribery, uh, or uh, proved that uh, the arbitrator was, you know, was bribed. Uh, so far, we're still uh, working under the auspice of providing uh, neutrality uh, of the arbitration. We have to solve a lot of problems that deal with the procedure, with the arbitration procedure, because uh, the uh, uh, conflict of interests, uh, loss of appeal right, uh, the court says that the party, when it uh, has some allegations uh, about the arbitrator being corrupted or being bribed by one of the parties, they must claim it, uh, state it in arbitration and not refer to this uh, situation once their uh, ruling is already being enforced. This year, we have, uh, well, our Ministry of Justice, together with the Ministry of Economic Development, have been uh, developing a concept of uh, reform, arbitration reform, to uh, make it more regular, to, to pass certain regulations. Uh, we uh, plan certain measures that uh, can be adopted in the future from some uh, disputable uh, measures like registration of arbitration courts uh, to some uh, very serious measures, uh, the issue of arbitrator, arbitrator's liability and uh, introducing amendments and uh, changes into Russian legislation which would allow us to uh, um, to check their arbitrator's uh, impartiality and uh, liability uh, could be a factor that could uh, rise the quality of arbitration. And uh, uh, there was also, I mean, once we were um, studying the cases, uh, the practice uh, of the public uh, procedure, we have also uh, considered an issue of reduced arbitration when uh, the ruling is passed uh, by uh, by only part of the arbitrators who are present, uh, who are presiding the, the case. When uh, we view the situation when an arbitrator has to leave the process for some uh, objective reasons. For example, we had a case when an arbitrator died before the, the ruling was passed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are other situations when an arbitrator um, being, uh, being bribed by one of the parties, uh, he simply does not appear before the, the court and he refuses to pass the ruling. He uh, suspends it. He, uh, uh, how do we react to this situation? Uh, unfortunately, uh, this final review of cases did not include this part. 
because arbitration uh, community uh, said that we were trying, uh, that we don't understand who are, uh, who the arbitrators are, and we don't understand their role in the process, and we were accused of uh, overseeing this this matter. Uh, we, as if we thought that arbitrator was uh, representing one of the parties. Uh, but we tried to show that uh, if an arbitrator enters uh, a certain relationship uh, with uh, with one of the parties, this party uh, carries the burden, uh, and uh, the decision, the ruling passed by this reduced number of arbitrators, will be enforced eventually. Uh, when we uh, have doubts about impartiality of the arbitrator, there's one more aspect which is also very important. It, uh, it uh, uh, refers to the scope of competence uh, of the arbitrator when we are talking about corruption. Uh, uh, using the case we managed to include into this review, we had a case describing a uh, situation when an arbitrator started to review the case, and one of the parties said that they don't want to. Um, uh, they said that uh, the agreement, uh, the contract, was entered under the pressure of one of the party, or the other party. The arbitration refused to consider this evidence, to consider this fact. They didn't. Uh, they didn't pass this uh, agreement as corrupted, and they couldn't. Uh, nobody could prove it. Uh, and there is a number of uh, questions: How could the arbitration uh, rule that the evidence was not relevant or was not uh, sufficient? Uh, these uh, disputes are not uh, a subject of arbitration. Uh, that's what the, uh, the ruling said. The final ruling said, and uh, this, the court said that the situation was uh, the the ruling uh, for the recipient of the bribe was passed after the arbitration decision. And uh, the state court uh, refused to enforce the, the ruling on the basis of the fact that the agreement was uh, had an element of corruption. So the courts legitimized uh, this uh, this agreement, and it breaches uh, the law of the Russian Federation. It breaches the procedure of the Russian Federation. And of course, there were many issues not mentioned in the case. Uh, what could be uh, the result of uh, such uh, agreements? I mean, what uh, competence does arbitration have? Neither of the um, of the parties have enforced the agreement. Has, have uh, what should have been done for them to do it? The fact is that Russian uh, legislation at present uh, does not uh, contain any uh, consequences. Does not mention any consequences uh, for such situations. So we're trying to understand uh, what are the trends, what uh, should we de develop in legislation. So we are trying to review uh, international experience, and we're trying to understand what can be done in this sense to adopt uh, uh, legislation which would uh, comply with international standards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Geoffroy Lyonnais. Uh, he is a partner at the law firm of Curtis Malay Prevost in the International Arbitration and Corporate Groups. Uh, his practice focuses on international arbitration and dispute resolution, especially investment arbitration, with a focus on representing states and state entities. Uh, Mr. Lyonnais is recognized as a leader in international arbitration by several publications. He's also uh, an ar experienced arbitrator and an expert witness uh, in French and international arbitration law before uh, U.S. courts. Uh, prior to joining his law firm, Mr. Lyonnais worked with the Unilever Corporation, and he's a member of the Commission on International Arbitration of the Paris Bar, the International Bar Association Arbitration Committee, and the French Committee on Arbitration. Jeff Wah. Thank you, Linda. So the, the top, today's topic is uh, as many aspects as stated earlier, and, and this presentation addresses the situation, my presentation, where the situation where a foreign investor claims that it is the victim 
of illegitimate and abusive criminal proceedings conducted by the host state. And then the investor brings an arbitration against the state for relief and damages in connection with those proceedings. In this situation, the criminal proceedings are the very subject matter of the arbitration and not just incidental. For instance, uh, this presentation does not address cases where the criminal proceedings are alleged to be in retaliation to the arbitration initiated by the investor or where uh, allegedly uh, the, uh, these criminal proceedings are used to circumvent the arbitration. Uh, in our case, the agreed investors commonly depicts those criminal proceedings as constituting harassment by the host state. The investor alleges, for instance, that these proceedings are politically motivated and that this harassment is meant to neutralize it or to ruin or to take away his investment. Depending on the facts of the matter, the foreign investor may claim that the alleged harassment is of such magnitude that it constitutes an indirect expropriation. Uh, typically, then, the investor will seek to obtain damages uh, equal to the fair market value of the expropriated investment. Uh, the investor may also claim that the criminal proceedings violate its right to a fair and equitable treatment, to non-discrimination, or to protection. And the investor will then seek to obtain damages for its losses. The problematic that is at the core uh, of such cases is that states undisputedly, as has been said before, have a sovereign, sovereign right to regulate their internal affairs and to investigate and prosecute crimes within their territories. So many questions arises from this subject, such as how is it then that arbitrators can have jurisdiction over such sovereign matters? What is the scope of their review? To what extent can the arbitrators second guess the investigative work of the state authorities? And on what basis? What level of proof is applicable and borne by which party? To what extent can the arbitrators interfere with such criminal proceedings? Today, uh, this is a vast topic, and today I, I, I will be focusing particularly on how a sovereign criminal matter be subjected to arbitration and to what extent arbitrators may interfere with criminal proceeding in taking provisional measures. With regard to the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals, states have objected that criminal matters are not arbitrable under their national laws and thus uh, they have objected to jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals. However, International arbitrators have routinely taken jurisdiction of, of a such matter. This has happened recently in various arbitration brought, brought against the Russian Federation. Uh, how is that? What makes this possible? Well, the first ingredient, if I may, which is at the core of the arbitrator's jurisdiction is the presence of a valid arbitration agreement concerning the investment that is to be found in a, in a contract, in, in an international treaty, such as a bilateral investment treaty, or, or even in a national law uh, on support of foreign investment. Such arbitration clauses are, have generally very broad and, and non-restrictive terms. For instance, uh, they refer to any dispute arising between the foreign investor and the contracting state. Arbitrators have generally regarded these broad arbitration clauses as potentially concerning any action of the state, including criminal proceedings. Well, the second ingredient uh, is the presence of obligations undertaken by the state vis-à-vis -vis the investor, whether uh, in a treaty, again, a national law on foreign investment, or a contract. These obligations commonly uh, include fair and equitable treatment, non-discrimination, protection of the investment, the duty to indemnify the investor in the event of expropriation. Arbitrators have considered that they may check 
and verify the compliance of the criminal proceedings conducted by the state against those international standards of conduct. However, in certain ways, the arbitrators are thus stepping on the, into the sovereign field of the state. There thus remain tensions between, on the one hand, the need to protect foreign investors against potential abuses, and on the other hand, the need to preserve a sovereign state's right and even its duty to investigate and prosecute crimes. So a proper balance must be uh, obtained between these antagonistic interests. Uh, I submit that the utmost caution and discretion should be used by arbitrators when entering the sovereign grounds of criminal proceedings. Uh, I must say that there is a tendency in the international arbitration community, especially with participants coming from commercial and Western type of backgrounds, to view perhaps too quickly and over simplistically the problem as a dispute between, on the one hand, a, a, a fragile and innocent investor in need for international protection, and on the other hand, overpowering states uh, that are too quickly uh, suspected of abusing their powers. Uh, while this may very well be true in, in certain cases, uh, international investment arbitration has also been used or even abused by not so innocent investors, even perhaps sometimes by rogue investors who in fact are not foreign and good faith investors. Such persons have sought to use the mechanism of foreign investment treatises and regulation to gain an, gain an undeserved protection against their own wrongdoings. Uh, let me take an illustrative, uh, to illustrate my point, let me take uh, an illustrative example which is inspired by pending arbitration that I happen to be involved in. You have a foreign investor that is prose prosecuted in a country for suspected crimes. Its local company is a cash business that is suspected to be used for money laundering. In addition, third parties have filed criminal complaints against the investors such as for extortion, corporate trade, and concerning precisely the local company in question. Uh, the police investigate those alleged crimes, interrogate employees, make seizures of corporate documents, then the investor leaves the country and its company shuts down. The investor then brings an arbitration against the state claiming damages for indirect expropriation. It alleges that it is a victim of political harassment, that the criminal complaints against it were fabricated, that it was threatened and forced to leave the country out of fear, that the police also took all the computers of the company and not just documents, all of which caused the loss of its businesses. In the course of the arbitral proceeding, the investor also asked for interim measures ordering the state to stop immediately these proceedings. From the state's point of view, the investor is simply seeking to avoid legitimate criminal proceedings and justice, using the arbitration as a shield. The, st the state stresses that it has a duty uh, to, um, to investigate these matters. It maintains that it never took the computer and most probably uh, the investor himself took them away to eradicate any evidence of money laundering. The state also maintains that the company was in fact poorly managed, was making losses, and was simply involuntarily shut down by its management in the context of an economic crisis. So what to make of all that? Uh, I'll be focusing here uh, today only on the aspect of provisional measures. Uh, so arbitrators are generally uh, consider that they, have, they generally have the power to issue interim measures. And they have considered that they have this power equally in, in, in cases involving uh, criminal proceedings. Uh, such uh, interim measures could go as far as enjoining the state to immediately suspend the investigations. Reasons put forward 
uh, for those measures are that the criminal investigation may hamper the integrity of the proceedings, the arbitration proceedings, affect the equality of the parties, or aggravate the dispute between them. However, asking the arbitral tribunal to interfere with the criminal proceedings by granting interim relief in favor of the investor raises serious problems. At first, a first issue is that this is generally happens at a very early stage of the proceeding when the arbitral tribunal is unlikely to have all the evidence necessary before it to appreciate the matter from an educated and form an educated judgment on the validity of the criminal proceedings. Moreover, the decisions on provisional measures is typically issued even before the uh, tribunal decide whether it has jurisdiction over the claims on the merits. So interfering with the state's criminal proceeding at this stage, when it is still possible that the arbitrators will ultimately decline to have jurisdiction, jurisdiction is puzzling. A second issue stems from the well-admitted principle that interim measures should not prejudge the merits of the case. In the situation at hand, the investor's case is that the criminal proceeding themselves constitute the alleged harassment and expropriation by the state and are the very subject matter of the arbitration. Under these circumstances, it's hard to see how an interim measure interfering with the criminal proceeding such as ordering their suspension will not prejudge the entire case and in fact irrevocably influence the judgment of the arbitrators. Also, the third issue as is normal, the investor will have the burden of showing the urgency of the requested measure and the risk of irreparable harm in the absence of such a measure. However, criminal investigation in any country of the world are always intimidating and in a way detrimental to uh, the person who is investigated. This does not mean per se that the, uh, these investigations are abusive. So the arbitrators uh, should be cautious when evaluating the risk of irreparable harm to the investor or to the proceedings. Uh, in fact, if legitimate criminal investigations are suspended, there is a risk of harm to the state, to the administration of justice, as well as to potential victims of the investor. Remember in my illustrative example, uh, third party victims have filed complaints against the investor. Therefore, arbitrators should seriously balance those potential harms in order to evaluate the opportunity of taking interim measures. And they indeed have done so in certain cases. In some, uh, interfering with criminal proceedings when they are the very subject matter of dispute, of the dispute in arbitration is a significant intrusion in the state's sovereign powers, rights, and even duties. This warrant the utmost circumspection and caution of the arbitrators. In particular, I submit that interfering interim measures can be ordered only in blatant cases of abuse by the state of its power with the burden of proof resting on the investor. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Wah. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ramanos uh, Odevechus, and uh, Ramanos is the co-head of his law firm's uh, section of dispute resolution. Uh, he handles most complex arbitration and high-stake commercial and regulatory litigation cases in Lithuania, as well as in foreign jurisdictions. Uh, Ramanos has a, s a substantial experience in resolving disputes related to shareholder conflicts, commercial transactions, securities and financing, distressed asset protection and investment. His practice involves handling matters before the Supreme Court of the Republic of Lithuania uh, and involved in, uh, he's been involved in advising clients in uh, litigation in the highest courts of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Azerbaijan, Latvia and Estonia as well. Uh, Ramanus has a wide range of experience acting in technically and commercially complicated disputes including some of the highest and most significant litigious matters conducted in Lithuania and in the Baltics, including defense of the most public cases in Lithuania in both the years 2010 and 2011. Ramanus. Thank you, Linda. Uh, as long as I'm in uh, Russian Federation, I'm switching to Russian. My presentation will be in Russian. 
Hello. My presentation will be uh, will be devoted to a case that's happening in the Baltics, which is quite close to your borders. And this information is about the instruments that can be used against the arbitration and the arbitration procedure, and which can end in criminal prosecution of the arbitrators or the parties. Uh, as everyone knows, some jurisdictions and the jurisdictions of some uh, countries have passed the laws that they can uh, make decisions when the tribunals are attacked, whenever certain cases are reviewed in, uh, in arbitration. And there, I there are no cases with uh, injunctions against the in investment arbitration. In New Zealand, there were cases when the state was trying to attack the investment arbitration body, but the court of the country uh, made the right decision, so there were no consequences. The cases that are well known in Eastern Europe are the cases of the, the British court Klaxon Engineering and Excalibur Ventures. In the Baltic countries, there is no special institute uh, of anti-arbitration injunction, which is only aimed at preventing the arbitration from solving or reviewing a certain case. But the important thing is that we have uh, an important tool, which is the um, intermediary measures based on the request of the parties or one party. There is another tool, which is the coordination claim, but it's usually reviewed for a very long time. Uh, there is usually no right of appeal, and receiving the final decision can take up to two years. So this is just a theoretical possibility. Well, in course, in, in case the court decides to uh, injunct uh, the future uh, arbitration, or maybe, maybe uh, put injunction to arbitration in general, this ruling uh, is enforced immediately. Who, uh, who are claimants, who are defendants, uh, uh, respondents, uh, who are attacked uh, by this uh, ruling? They are arbitrators themselves. Uh, are a victim in this case uh, uh, because uh, this institution itself, uh, as you see in, in Lithuania, we have uh, a major uh, institution, uh, a permanent institution. I'm speaking of uh, Vilnius uh, Commercial Arbitration Court, which uh, uh, considers a lot of cases. Uh, in Latvia, the problem is, is bigger and uh, um, and Latvian market for uh, with arbitration cases uh, has a different shape. We have sim they have similar problems like those we have in Russia. They have a lot of arbitration courts which are not regulated at all, and uh, nobody understands who is behind these arbitration courts. And the rulings, the decisions are criticized. Apart from uh, the unlike the arbitration institutional arbitration courts recognized by the Chamber of Commerce. In Estonia, the situation is similar to the Lithuanian. Uh, um, Lithuania and Estonia are more alike, while Latvia differs, uh, is, uh, has more institutions and more problems. Uh, uh, these Professional measures uh, can um, can uh, uh, provide for uh, ill use of arbitration. 
uh, well, uh, certain situations when you can't uh, uh, go to the uh, to the Lithuanian court and ask them to take measures against the normal arbitration. What comes next if uh, the court uh, uh, makes uh, passes a ruling that is enforced, uh, and you can understand that it is only valid uh, on the territory of the sovereign state? Uh, to make it uh, enforceable, to, to, to enforce it against a certain arbitrator who, is, uh, who lives in a different country, it should be acknowledged. If we see the, uh, if we see, uh, see, view the situation of acknowledgement, there are two instruments. Uh, the first one is the bilateral bilateral agreements on on legal aid. Uh, all uh, Baltic states have uh, bilateral entered bilateral agreements with the former uh, Soviet republics. And uh, if we look at the European Union, we already have uh, a document, uh, a Brussels Brussels. Uh, a uh, document which uh, provides for these um, for these uh, temporary uh, measures, but uh, uh, European uh, court practice uh, is very negative towards anti-suit uh, injunction. Uh, uh, regardless, I mean, uh, no matter whether it regards arbitration or other types of courts. Uh, well, uh, the Brussels document uh, is not applied to arbitration, but uh, other well courts of other jurisdiction, uh, courts of other con countries of other states uh, should not influence the uh, the case that is uh, reviewed in other EU arbitration courts. After the decision is made, after it is, it should be enforced. It should be enforced on the basis of uh, the local regulations and acts or uh, based on international acts. And as you can see, uh, the uh, court uh, ban, the court uh, prohibition that does not allow their arbitrators to uh, consider the case. Uh, if we're talking about neighboring countries, for example, with Russia, we have a bilateral uh, agreement, or it is uh, acknowledged by a, bila a, bil a bilateral agreement. As I said, after it has been acknowledged, it should be enforced. Uh, the enforcement uh, has uh, well, influences the decision. Uh, the tribunal uh, should uh, think what they do uh, with this enforcement after they receive this uh, decision. How do they enforce them in the state uh, uh, of one of the arbitrators? Uh, it's not the practice of the Baltic states when the state itself uh, defends its own interests. In Ethiopia, for example, in Addis Ababa, they have uh, uh, provided for measures uh, that allowed one of their uh, arbitrators to stay away from the uh, from the arbitration and could not perform actions that were in conflict with this uh, with this uh, decision with this amendment their arbitrator has a right to decide what they do next and what they don't do next uh, once tribunal uh, follows the case and makes the decision, it can uh, influence the enforcement uh, of the decision uh, on the territory of the arbitration, uh, on the territory of the state of the arbitration. And, uh, and that, or there can be other uh, consequences. In all Baltic states, uh, the criminal codes have uh, norms uh, and provisions uh, that uh, call for uh, criminal prosecution for non-enforcement. Uh, once uh, those temporary measures are considered in the Baltics, I mean, if the uh, these temporary measures are equal to any other 
decision that should be enforced. These uh, provisions of the criminal codes, I'm talking about uh, Article 245 in Lithuania and uh, article, uh, the articles in the Latvian and Estonian uh, uh, criminal code, they all provide for the enforcement of the uh, decisions of the arbitration courts on the territory of all three states. If there's a, a party uh, which uh, uh, asked for the uh, injunction, if the party is aggressive, if the party is planning to attack the arbitrators in the future or the parties that uh, carry on their dispute uh, in, uh, in the arbitration, they can uh, go to certain bodies uh, uh, that theoretically can start a criminal case against those who are not uh, complying with the requirement with this uh, with this decision uh, uh, the courts uh, normally uh, shouldn't intervene i mean it's, it's an exceptional case when the courts would intervene in their work of the arbitration court uh, pluses and minuses uh, the the minus is that that uh, the legal system itself uh, allows for intervention, uh, which uh, ruins the whole idea of arbitration and the competence-competence doctrine. On the other hand, these uh, criminal uh, acts, I mean, uh, actions are not criminal uh, uh, are not criminal cases. I mean, they're not uh, under the criminal code. They don't. Uh, uh, and to sum up, since I'm, I'm already almost over my limit, I would like to add that starting a case, uh, a criminal case in uh, in Latvia, Estonia, or Lithuania, it does not mean that our arbitrator who is not under the jurisdiction of these three countries uh, should uh, start to worry immediately, but it does uh, hinder the process. I mean, this fact would hinder the process. Uh, as a rule, uh, our lawyers, our attorneys, our uh, uh, we try to work to, to avoid these situations. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our last speaker is Bruce Orr, who is a counselor in the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice. Uh, Bruce began his work at the U U.S. Department of Justice in 1991, working for eight years as a, an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, prosecuting securities fraud and violent gangs. Uh, in 1999, uh, Bruce joined the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. as the Chief of Organized uh, Crime Division and has for the last two years been the Counselor uh, at the Criminal Division uh, on Organized Crime and International Affairs. Bruce? Thank you. I'd like to um, offer a few brief remarks today on the subject of this panel uh, from the prosecutor's perspective. Um, Obviously, international arbitration is, uh, you know, a topic of growing interest, uh, as evidence, evidenced by uh, some of the other panels uh, going on at this conference. Uh, it's seen, I think, correctly as a relatively cheap, flexible, and uh, efficient way to resolve disputes, uh, especially in compared to traditional litigation. Um, and the world of arbitration would seem to be completely re removed from the world of, of crime and prosecutors and drug dealers and that sort of thing. Um, but as I think the panel has demonstrated today, unfortunately, uh, these worlds do overlap at times, uh, and then that uh, uh, creates very diff difficult problems uh, in the arbitration context. Um, we've seen, a, we heard about a variety of situations in which crime can seep into the uh, arbitration process, all the way from the uh, collusive sham arbitrations of the kind that Barton was describing uh, to situations where, for one reason or, or another, criminal aspects have come to the fore uh, in arbitration, such as when you have um, uh, a contract, but the contract uh, may be used as a vehicle itself for money laundering or for bribe payments, uh, or uh, where uh, a, a corrupt country uh, may be taking advantage of a, um, its sovereign power to try to negate or, or you know, uh, uh, 
get out of a contract it should otherwise be observing with respect to inv an investor. And that's aside from all the usual kind of the common problems one might expect to arise in arbitrations, just as in any litigation context where you have problems of false testimony um, and that sort of thing. And, and I think what the panel has demonstrated is that arbitrators, when, when confronted with these kinds of situations, are, are there's sort of a, um, uh, it, it, it's sort of a um, philosophical almost uh, problem uh, for arbitrators because arbitration, the whole concept of arbitration, the way it's done rests upon a certain series of assumptions uh, and those assumptions include things like the rule of law will apply, uh, that the parties uh, have a genuine dispute and that they're seeking a cost-effective way uh, to resolve it within the law um, and that sort of thing. And as we've seen, those assumptions in today's very complex international world can be undermined. They can be undermined in some cases by a, a, a state that may be acting in a corrupt fashion. But I would, uh, I would suggest that the danger we should be looking for uh, as we go forward is the, is the danger that these kinds of assumptions that underlie arbitration and civil law practice in general uh, can be undermined and are being undermined by organized crime. Uh, and that's something that I think is, is something is beginning to be realized. It's, is, I think, as was pointed out at the beginning of the panel, it's sort of a, an emerging problem. But I don't think it's been fully appreciated, and I don't think we, we've seen um, the, the, the real dangers that can come from the involvement of organized crime in, in, these, kinds of, um, in these kinds of proceedings. I mean, organized crime uh, on a transnational level is something that's really only been seen over the last 15, 10, 15 years uh, as a problem uh, that, that countries are having to confront. Uh, and it's something that, that affects us in the United States, but I think it affects people in countries all over the world. Um, in the United States, we've been studying this problem and, and determined that uh, organized crime is growing rapidly on an international uh, basis and is responsible for things like uh, a, a rise in the amount of money laundering uh, that's going on around the world. Uh, it's responsible for undermining the legitimacy of governments, um, corrupting uh, state officials, which could lead to some of the kinds of situations we've talked about this morning, um, and, in, and undermining the integrity of our financial systems and other markets that we're really depending on uh, in this globalized economy uh, going forward. So. Um, the, the, the question, I think, or, or the one question we should worry about is, you know, what happens when uh, organized criminals begin to take advantage of the arbitration process to further their illegal aims? For example, by setting up a, a sham arbitration where um, a party seeking to launder a large amount of money, illegal proceeds, uh, are used in arbitration between a, what look like two legitimate companies uh, as a way to disguise the origin of proceeds and then the party receiving the arbitration award is then able to uh, claim that this is legitimate money uh, you know, resulting from this uh, arbitration award. Um, and I think the, there, the part of the conflict there if for arbitrators is that arbitration is seen as effective and is, uh, is resorted to precisely because it is seen as less formal and because it has a certain amount of confidentiality attached to it. And so the parties to the arbitration may feel that this is a great way to disguise their, their uh, ill-gotten gains because nobody's going to be able to look into or, di or look behind the arbitration award to see what gave rise to it. Uh, and what I would suggest is that um, arbitrators, uh, people involved in the arbitration process, whether you're a party or an arbitrator or part of an institution uh, that, that um, uh, supports uh, arbitration proceedings, uh, have to be very careful not to let uh, the, the confidentiality uh, of arbitration procedures um, facilitate uh, criminal activity. Uh, in some countries, there are specific regulations on this uh, where uh, uh, people who are involved in arbitration in one way or another may find that under the laws of that country, they may have some sorts of uh, duty uh, to report either as uh, uh, you know, a fi financial transaction or a duty to report a crime. Um, but beyond that, what I would suggest is that um, people involved in the arbitration process should be sensitive to the possibility of criminal activity uh, coming up in the context of, of arbitration or, and, and be willing to work with law enforcement in different countries uh, to 
uh, bring some attention to this problem uh, so that law enforcement, you know, working cooperatively between countries, since these, we're talking about an international context, can try to uncover uh, these sorts of schemes and, and, and where, where necessary bring uh, criminal proceedings against uh, corrupt parties or, or you know, whatever, uh, if they hire corrupt arbitrators or, or whatever that, uh, that they're trying to use the process for. Um, it, it's, the, it's the kind of a problem that, that um, you know, it, it's not, if, if people don't bring this to the attention of governments, uh, it's not going to be acted on. Uh, the, these are very complicated schemes. Criminals are, are uh, able to come up with um, schemes much more quickly than governments can come up with legislation uh, or come up with ways of detecting uh, these schemes. And, and I think what, what people looking at governments, particularly like at the uh, U.S. Department of Justice or something, would, would assume that we have the resources and the ability to, to uh, scan uh, agreements or, or transactions going on all around the world and look for criminal activity when the fact is, is our resources are quite limited and that without the assistance of uh, private citizens, private parties, uh, we are not going to be able to detect, uh, let alone check, uh, organized crime activity, which is exactly what the criminals are counting on uh, in, their bill in their efforts to try to expand their, their empire and uh, you know, create more illegal profits. So what I would like to end with is just to uh, ask that uh, people who are involved in the process, and I know we have many uh, highly qualified professionals here, uh, you know, be open or, or consider the possibility uh, when they see these kinds of indicators uh, to come to um, law enforcement and, and talk with us uh, so that we can try to uh, not, not let arbitration become a, a venue by which organized criminals can advance their goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Or any questions from the panel to each other? I have one question for Katrina, uh, which is the, the proposed reforms uh, addressing issues of, of corruption and the like that you've, that you've mentioned, um, did those uh, target international commercial arbitration or is it really more domestic arbitration? And have the problems that you've seen been principally in the domestic arbitration area or, or is it international arbitration? Well, I have to clarify that what I was saying about the concept of development of uh, arbitration is about internal arbitration, in-country arbitration, because state authorities are trying to do something. Even that is kind of suspicious for me, because arbitration is by its nature a private institution, a civil society institution. And any changes in this area are only possible through self-regulation. It's interesting that uh, the regulatory function of the state is not who is driving this effort. The Ministry of Justice doesn't want to be registering arbitration courts. They are trying to avoid it at all costs. Uh, but the Chamber of Commerce, the community of business people, they are the driving force of deeper involvement of the state because they want to raise the level of trust that the system enjoys. As for corruption, it's mostly about foreign arbitration regarding corruption uh, rich contracts. The, the court declined to enforce a decision by a foreign arbitration body, uh, which had to be enforced on the... Uh, basically, the idea was to enforce a corruption deal on the territory of Russia. Between the panel or from the audience, uh, I'll ask Bruce a question. Uh, why wouldn't the uh, international criminals uh, just choose a jurisdiction where confidentiality is very important and have their arbitration there? Right. <coughs> I think they probably will uh, when they have the chance to do so. Um, and, and so part of the problem is 
the, the, you know, any kind of arbitration like that, it's not going to happen entirely within the, the sort of safe jurisdiction. There are going to be effects outside. You know, parties are going to be coming in from outside. Money is going to be flowing through the international system. Uh, the, part, the problem for the criminals is to try to take the money they have and clean it in a way that they can then use it in the, in the Western financial system. Uh, and so I think that uh, anybody who has contact with this process, uh, I'm not saying they have a duty to report, and, but I, mean, I am saying that they, they will have the opportunity at times to see transactions like that that, that look clearly wrong, that, that there's something clearly going, just as Barton was describing in his, uh, in his experience of that one case, it maybe didn't get far enough for them to say, oh, this is clearly a, a criminal contract that's going on. But even if the arbitration is happening in a, in a, uh, you know, a, a money laundering jurisdiction or something like that, there are going to be effects elsewhere. Because otherwise, it, it doesn't do the criminals any good. They, they need to move their money eventually and make it available to them elsewhere. And I think that's the place where I'm asking that, that people who are involved in the process, uh, people who are uh, lawyers, uh, accountants, or whatever, who have some connection, uh, may see these kinds of indications, whether it's a a contract that, uh, or that, you know, a fake arbitration because it looks like a contract that, um, you know, it's too one-sided, the other side doesn't put up a fight, or the uh, amount of money that's involved seems way, way out of proportion to the size of the contract, or other indicators or badges of fraud. Those are the kinds of things that, that we would ask uh, be brought to the attention of, of law enforcement. Thank you. Any other questions? Y yes, sir. Professor Malinowski, I have a question for all participants from Europe. As a practitioner, I understand your problems very well. My question is on the border of theory and practice. Sometimes the state in Russia or in the Commonwealth of Independent States, at all costs, tries to take the business from foreign investors. Commercial arbitration is not always helpful. Do you think using the, uh, the practice of the European Court for Human Rights uh, and the rights of the legal person for fair trial and protection from expropriation Can the property of a foreign investor can be used through the European Court of Human Rights? What What is your opinion? Significant overlap <coughs> between the disciplines covered in investment treaties and those covered in the European Convention of Human Rights. And you will sometimes see judgments of the Court, European Court of Human Rights in cases involving companies and businesses. Uh, the difficulty from a practitioner's perspective is that the amount of compensation that the European Court of Human Rights tends to award is very low compared to that which you could get in a Western European court or in an international arbitration tribunal. And so as a result, it is, it is a relatively rare case where uh, it makes sense from a purely commercial perspective to pursue a claim in the European Court of Human Rights as opposed to in international uh, arbitration. I, I guess the other thing that I'd say is that the European Court of Human Rights, although it frequently finds that states are too slow in deciding uh, civil and commercial cases in their own court systems is one of the slowest courts, in fact, um, that, that, that exists. And, and so the, res the justice that the European Court of Human Rights grants typically comes uh, five or seven years after the case is first filed with it. And that case can be filed with it only after all local remedies have been exhausted. So it's a very long process to get to even if you win a very small amount, in my view. 
I would like to add that the European uh, Court for Human Rights is one of the forums where it can be defended. There is no doubt about that. And you certainly, you certainly thought about the Yukos versus Russia, uh, which is not decided there. But sometimes you can, you can get a double. Uh, reward so if you if you want a real commercial reward a real commercial compensation the european court is not the place to be however you as the investor might have no other tools but this is probably the tool of ra last resort before you go there you have to go through all the national loops Excellent question. I would like to add, um, I agree completely with what the colleague said about the European Court, uh, with the qualification that apart from paying compensation, uh, there is a, an option of review of uh, the decision made by National Court uh, in the light of new evidence. And uh, the investment arbitration, uh, there are complexities of its own kind, because for Russia, the jurisdiction of the exit tribunal is not obligatory. Practice shows that enforcement of investment arbitration decisions against Russia is not always a, an easy task. The Zittelmer and the Nokia cases, uh, they all witness they will bear testimony uh, um, that it is sometimes quite complicated to receive the compensation that the states owes you. Panelists want to comment? No? Okay. Are there any other questions? Any other questions from the panel? Well, we have finished on time, and I thank everyone for their uh, attention to this panel, this very important panel. And let's thank the panelists.